Hey there! So today we are going to talk about recurrent neural networks. These are some interesting architectures that are built on top of the normal neural networks that we've been seeing so far. I think uh, seeing these kind of different architectures are important to understand what kind of spins can be put on top of the recurrent, uh, the normal neural networks that we've been looking at in this course. So uh, I will introduce to you what they are, how they learn, uh, what is different for them, and also some of the improvements that have been made on them uh, over the years. And we will also see how to implement them using Keras in, in a very simple way. Um, so let's get started. Uh, let's remember what a neural network look like. You know, it's quite sequential. You have the input and then the input information is passed to the hidden layer and then it is passed to the output. And one thing that we can look to here or like pay attention to here is that the words or a features or basically any little bits of information that are in the same data point are given at the same time. But we do not have any relational information between them. They are just given as separate information to our network with recurrent neural networks. How this is different is that we have timestamps. So this is the first timestamp, this is the second timestamp, and so on and so forth. So if we think that we are giving it a sentence, for example, the big dog jumped me, <laughs> let's say, um, the first input will be D. And then an output would be calculated based on what kind of thing that you want to do. And then this output would also be passed to the second timestamp. So this is a second timestamp. And then we, the second input is big. So we get the, the output of the first timestamp, the input from the second timestamp. And then again, we calculate an output and then pass this output to the third timestamp and so on and so forth. So this is the difference that recurrent neural networks have. And the nice thing about them is that you do not have to specify how many timestamps that you need in the beginning. So in this picture, it might look like, hey, but Mr. it looks like, yes, I do need to create as many timestamps as I have words in a sentence, for example. But actually, this is a unrolled version of an RNN. An RNN actually looks like this. It is just one cell or one unit, whatever you want to call it, there is an input, there is an output, and the output is passed back into it. So actually, all of these are identical. All of these are just the same thing. It's just this is an RNN, and if you unfurl it, this is what it would look like. So this kind of the unfurled version is used to make it easier for people to understand how this whole thing works. Uh, there are a bunch of ways how you can use RNNs. You don't have to give inputs and get outputs in every single timestamp. For example, uh, one thing you can use is sequence to sequence. So what we talked about so far, you give an input at each timestamp and you get an output in each timestamp. And things like this can be used for, for example, price forecasting or stock exchange forecasting, kind of things that are like time series data that you can use this for kind of forecasting purposes. You have sequence to vector. Um, you might pay attention here that I am talking about vectors and not singles. Sometimes you see the sequence as sequence to single or single to sequence. Uh, the difference, the only difference from the previous one is that you only pay attention to the last output and that's why it's called single or vector. The reason we say vector instead of single is that the output looks like a vector and it's not just a single number. That's why to not create a confusion we use the word vector but using the word single is also fine. So with sequence to vector what you do is you get a time you get an input in each timestamp but you ignore the outputs of all of these timestamp only you take pay attention to the one that is the last. So you can think of this as kind of like a classification sort of thing, or if you're trying to score something, like a sentiment score of a whole sentence, or if you want to understand an email is scam or not, right? You would need to see uh, a full sentence or a full email before you can um, tag it as scam or not. So that's why we would be feeding the words into it one by one and then getting the verdict at the end. So we would only pay attention to the last output. Then you have vector to sequence or single to sequence, where you would give one input at the beginning of the training on the first timestamp, and then you would not give an input anymore. And then you would just expect your network to output a sequence of things. So what could this be? Uh, you give a photo to it and it captions the photo. So let's say I give it a photo of a dog running on the beach, 
and then my outputs would be the first one would be a and the second one would be dog and third one would be running and the the rest would be like on the beat so basically for each of these um, timestamps you would get a new word that will complete a whole caption for your image lastly we have encoder and decoder sort of uh, rnn architectures and basically how that works is that you have two sections in your RNN. It's still in the same RNN like we did before. It's just you output, you ignore the outputs and the first section of it, you only give it inputs, the feed it inputs. And then in the second section, you do not give it inputs anymore and you look at the outputs from then on. And what you can use this for is very simply translation because if you use, for example, sequence to sequence for translation, what's going to happen is that you're going to give one word and it's immediately going to translate that word. And that might be a good translation. But, you know, if you ever try to do in your head, for example, direct translations of sentences of words from one language to the other, you might have realized that it doesn't work because the words take a meaning based on the context of the sentence. So you would have to see most of the sentence, if not all, to be, under to be able to understand what word needs to uh, be translated as which other word in the other language. So that's why first showing the whole sentence to the model and then getting the translations is what we do when we're doing translations with RNN, so in an encoder-decoder way. Okay, but how does RNNs work or how do they learn? So it's actually quite simple and quite similar to the normal learning process of neural networks. Uh, the only difference is that this time we call it backpropagation through time because, you know, we have timestamps and uh, we give one input per timestamp and then at the end the information or the weights and um, the parameters of the network is updated. So. As always, we just you, you can think of it in an unrolled form for form for easier uh, understanding. We give the inputs, pass the output to the next one, give the input, pass the output to the next one, and then an output is calculated. And depending on which outputs you are looking into, if you're looking into all of them, if you're paying attention to all of them, this is a sequence to sequence network. You take care, you take all of them. Or if this is a sequence to vector one, for example, then you only look at the last one. Um, by looking at the ones that you are not ignoring, you calculate the cost on them. Uh, and once the cost is calculated, then you calculate the gradients like we did previously with the backpropagation gradient descent. And this gradients are passed back, passed back into your network and the weights are updated basically. One thing that you need to keep in mind is that if you are only looking into the last two outputs and these are the ones that you use to calculate the cost, the gradients are only going to fl be flowing back towards uh, from them. So we are not going to flow the gradients back from the second output of Y2 here or Y1 or Y0. And another thing that you need to understand that as we said, this is an unfurled version of just one unit of RNN. So actually the weights and biases in here are identical and they're going to be updated more or less depending on which uh, uh, position or timestamp they're in. But at the end of the day, these are identical and then once this is updated, it means all of them are being updated. And this is just something that you need to keep in mind when you're working with RNNs. So let's uh, put them into a little bit more of official or formal way because right now we have numbers like right? zero, one, two, three, four. But actually when you think in a more formal way, we can say the last one is timestamp T. And then as you go backwards, you have T minus one, T minus two up until however long your network is. Another thing to keep in mind is that at first, because we do not have an output from a previous timestamp, and the first timestamp, we just basically feed the network zero. But um, this is basically going to depend on the uh, implementation of the current neural networks that you're using, but giving zero is kind of the uh, standard way. Okay, so let's zoom in in one of these ones. So let's say we zoomed in on the last one. What this looks like is basically, it is a little cell that has two inputs and outputs the same thing in two different ways. But it basically has neurons in there, right? It basically is a, a way of training these inputs or calculating an output using these two inputs. And how are these, how, are, how is this output calculated? So let's look into that now. So basically what you do is you multiply or go take your input through 
a set of network, a set of uh, neurons, and then you calculate output one. And you do the same thing for your input, and then you calculate output two. And at the end, as always, what we're going to do is we take output one, we uh, sum it up with output two, and then we also sum up bias on top of it. And then we put all of them in an activation function. So in normal neural networks, you would only have the input times the weights, and then we would have an output and we will add the bias. But this time we also have the output of the previous timestamp and we also add that to the mix. But let's look at it in a more official way. So, okay, this is the output two, I, I put one, I put two, bias, put in an activation function. But what are these exactly? So we saw that one of the inputs are x t in timestamp, the input in time, t timestamp, the output from t minus one timestamp, and they are multiply, but basically taking them through neurons, what does it mean? Multiplying them with weights. So they basically have their own set of weights. So if I put this in an actual formula, what it's going to look like is this input weights times the input, output from the previous layer, uh, weights times the output from the previous layer, plus bias and put them through an activation function. But um, I will show you how this is calculated and with some numbers, so it's a little bit easier to understand because sometimes this is a little bit confusing. And that's also nice to know what the uh, dimensions of these matrices look like. Okay, so this is our equation, right? Let's say this is Wx, so this is the weights that we apply to the inputs and this is the output. The output will have the length of time steps. So if it is a um, sentence, all of these numbers will represent a sentence, a word. And of course, normally to represent words, you're going to need more than one number. So this might end up looking like a matrix in itself too. But to keep things simple, I will just say, you know, we have three input uh, timestamps. And let's say maybe that this is kind of time series data. This is how much uh, energy I had two days ago. This is how much energy I felt like I had yesterday. And this is how much energy I have today out of one. So I want to calculate like, how much energy I'm going to have tomorrow. Very simple. Um, in the weight matrices, we are going to have as many rows as time steps, time steps and as many columns as the neurons that we decide to have in this uh, recurrent neural network cell in this specific cell. Uh, so we did this before, but just to go through it quickly, how you calculate the output of this is that, you know, you multiply these two and then you get the number and then you multiply the next ones and then multiply the next ones and then you have an output. Same with the second column, you do the same thing and then you have an output. And this basically, this little uh, array, let's say, is the output here. So given this, that it's has two columns and that is the number of neurons that you have as we've also seen here uh, the output of this part where you multiply the weights with the a different set of weights though uh, with the output from the previous layer and also the bias is going to have the same shape so when you um, sum them together then you're going to have an output of this shape so this is just for you to kind of know how things work or things are calculated uh, under the hood so there is a very common way how RNNs are depicted. We do not really use that there are neurons and there are input neurons and there are connections between them sort of thing anymore. There is a way to show them graphically and I think it's actually quite simple. I will introduce to you that here. So it's also easier for you to understand later when you're looking into LSTMs or GRU cells or if there are any new cells that are being um, introduced. So what do I do? The first thing, of course, I have is that I, have, I am multiplying my output from the previous time step with my weights that belong to this part the, that were supposed to be multiplied with that one. And then I have my weights for the input and I multiply them here. So basically I am creating this formula, but on a diagram. And then to both of these, I add the bias. So I add both of them plus the bias to it. And then I, put them through an activation function. Dominantly hyperbolic ten tangent function is used, so 10H is used uh, for RNN, simple RNN cells, but th this can be changed of course, but this is kind of a default value also in Keras. What happens is then you pass all of this information, this, basically we've done all of this, and then we pass it to the next time step, and then we also pass it as an output to the outside world for anyone to use. But 
The difference is that sometimes to calculate the output of your cell or time step, you might put your output or the thing that you calculated through another activation function because hyperbolic tangent would give you an output that is between zero minus one and one, but maybe you want an output that is between zero and one. So you might need to apply something else here, something new, like a softmax function. And what happens is then your output and the thing that you pass to the next time step is different. Well, this is actually in a very simple RNN cell. That's not the case. You pass the exact output to the next time step, but in a more advanced uh, RNN architecture or in a more advanced RNN cell, the thing that we pass to the next time step is not exactly the same as what we're outputting. And that's why this has a different name. This is called the hidden uh, state. It's the state of the cell that we're passing to the next time step.